So here's field tools, which we use to connect to our FB3000. You can see I already have an active connection uh, to my device. So when we start a uh, connection, it actually opens FBX Connect, which I have open now. And this is what I use to uh, configure the FB3000 and download applications, or upload history. Well, you can see that I've got all of my uh, cards here. So if I were to remove an I.O. module on the FB2000, that would reflect on my screen. And I can click on a card to actually configure it. So um, what I'm going to show you here in FBX Connect is how to configure the standard uh, firmware controls, which allow you to have a plug and play uh, control programming. Before I get into that, though, I want to show you uh, just a couple I.O. points, which I'm actually using in my control examples. So let's go to Configure I.O. Analog Input. And I'm using one analog input to represent uh, a tank level. So I'm imagining that I have a tank. Uh, it has a level. It's going up and down. And you can see here that I'm using the override value, which is currently 11.5 feet, now 12 feet. So I'm using that uh, to base my control stuff off of. Uh, let's now go to a discrete output. And I'm using one discrete output point to simulate a tank outlet valve. So if this is on or off, that'll be open or closed. And that tells me if my tank should be you know, emptying or filling up. So now that we've got taken care of those, now let's actually go look at our control uh, objects. Quick note about the control objects. Uh, in the FB3000, you actually have a dynamic amount of each of your standard control objects. You can see here on this screen in the control setup, we have 100 maximum controls of which you can freely divide those amongst our action blocks, math blocks, effects, and PID loops. And you can see the standard setup here, which is 48, 12, 16, 24. But if you want you know, 50 PID loops and 50 math blocks, you can do that. Or 75 action blocks, 25 effects. It's all up to you according to your use case. So let's uh, first look at our PID loops. PID loops are um, you know, standard industry uh, uh, controls that allow you to tune the response to a, a process variable uh, meeting a set point. So if you have, for instance, a tank level, you have the level that actually is the process variable versus the level where you want it to be, your set point, and the PID loop will monitor that difference and you know, the rate of change and will open or close your valve to uh, meet that set point at a certain speed um, for your valve. And you, that's, um, it allows you, you basically you tune these P, I, and D variables. So when you're configuring this PID loop, and uh, note that on this top left, you can choose which PID loop, because we had 24 PID loops configured. Uh, so in PID loop 1, you see that this screen allows very easy configuration, where you have these radio buttons for enable, disable, uh, to turn the output from discrete to analog. Uh, for a loop type, you can have a primary, which is just one PID loop. Or you can actually have dual control, which allows you to have a primary variable and an override variable so that, um, you know, let's say you're monitoring on pressure normally, but if the temperature gets too high, you would switch to temperature control or vice versa, right? Yeah, it's up to you. And you also have this override only to allow you to debug your override loop. So I'm going to keep this on primary control and note that that will actually hide my override uh, settings. And you see here, here's my actual primary value. Uh, here, and then you can see here's the set point tracking. Here's the current output. So you see this PID loop actually is running right now. Let's go to the inputs and outputs tab now. Here's where I configure uh, you know, what values do, am I using for my inputs and what point am I using for my outputs. Notice that for each of my um, points, I have this three uh, dots button. If I click on that, that's going to open up a point picker. And this allows me to find a point within my FB3000 database, which is where all the data is held. So for my input, I'm using an analog input point. So you see I've selected an analog input object. When I open up that object, I have all of my analog input instances. And then for this selected instance, I have a list of parameters. And each parameter has a tag and a value and a data, and a data type. So here I'm reading the selected value parameter of my analog input instance 2.1, which was that tank level that I showed you earlier. So, I'll, so notice the current value 7.5. If I click it again, it's changed out of 12.5 because it's constantly being updated. So I'll click OK here. And then you see I'm also reading the set point, and I'm writing to an analog output just for this PID loop. 
And if we go to the advanced tab, you'll see the PID, the PID loop has some advanced properties for what happens if our um, data goes bad, like we have a communications error, or what happens if we restart, do you want to keep going or you know, disable the loop. Uh, and then the last tab was the tuning loop. Here's where you attune your P, I, and D tuning parameters to give your loop uh, the certain speed or behavior characteristics that you want. And you see here in this uh, tr uh, trend, we're actually showing our process variable, our set point, and our current output. And you can see that as my process variable, my level goes up and down, our output is actually going up and down with it. Although in this case, um, my, the, the output for the PID loop isn't actually changing our process variable. So you see we're not actually nearing our set point. I'm just showing this PID loop as an example, but it's actually being controlled by my other controls. So at this point, let me show you the other controls I have set up. Uh, next, I'll show you the math block. And the math block control allows you to set up custom calculations, um, and which you can then use you know, in other places in the device. Uh, notice again, you, we've got the, the 12 math blocks that we had configured. And I'm using math block one to actually simulate that, um, that tank level, which I'm using for my other controls. So you see that I'm taking in that AI21 selected as my current tank level. And then I'm taking in the value of that discrete output, which is my output outlet flow valve, which is on or off, open or closed. And then I'm just calculating a new tank level, which is my current level plus 0 0.5. So I'm imagining that my tank level is always rising. But if my outlet valve is open, then I'm subtracting 1. So actually, it's decreasing if my valve is open, because it's letting liquid out the bottom. Then you can see here, uh, it shows you the value of my tank level and then the new value as I'm writing to it and I'm writing back to the override value of my analog input. So I just have this set up to show you how a math block works and to show you that I'm simulating a tank level which I'm using in my other controls. Now let's go to the action blocks, and here's where I've really got my control set up for this example. I'm using action block one to simulate a uh, level high, high switch. So what an action block does is it allows you to take a value and then compare it to another value. In this case, I'm saying, is my tank level greater than or equal to 15, which is my high, high set point? And when it is, this action block will become true and will do something. In, uh, notice there's different options for what an action block can do when it becomes active. In this case, I'm having it trip an effect, which is a different type of control that I'll show you after this. And the effect. I'm tripping is called uh, open valve. You see I've labeled effect one as open valve. So I've got another action block. Let's go now to action block two. And action block two is my um, low, low uh, action block. So this should say low, low set point here. So he in action block two, I'm saying, is my tank level less than or equal to five? And if so, this will become active and it will trip effect two, which closes my valve. So if the valve is closed, then no liquid escapes the tank, and the tank level rises again. Um, so you see I've got two action blocks, one for the high level, one for the low level, which trip two effects, one to open the valve, one to close the valve. So you can imagine that um, you, know, if you would have sent action blocks whenever you, um, you have something that causes something to happen, and the effects whenever something you, know, you want to trigger something that needs to happen. And then again, you have all these action blocks available. And for each action block, in addition to this, um, this general tab where you set up your controls, you also have a bypass uh, tag where you can put this action block in bypass. Uh, you can connect it to other action blocks, and you have certain types of latching logic. And then you can also actually chain the logic together, where maybe this action block is only true if this block and a previous block are tripped. Or you, know, or you can make it or, or NAND with another action block. So you can actually do quite complex logical sequences with multiple action blocks chained together. Now let's look at the last type of control, the effects, which are exactly what they sound like. When an action block triggers an effect, the effect does the effect that you want it to do. So in this case, my effect one is set to open valve, and it's writing to that discrete output, which I showed you earlier. And it's going to write a 1 when it's active. 1 meaning open valve in, in this case. You can see that you can also have an effect require a reset. So when it requires a reset, then it 
stays on until you have a reset point that turns it off. In this case, though, I do not want it to require a reset. Um, okay, so let's go to close valve. My effect two does the opposite. It's a close valve, so it writes to the same point, but it writes a zero here instead of a one. Uh, notice you can also have effects write when they're inactive, in addition to writing when active, and you can also configure it so that it's continuously writing or it only writes the moment it becomes active. Uh, so you see that's what these, this is, and then here you can see whether it's active or not at the current moment. So these are the standard controls. We got PID loops, math blocks, action blocks, and effects. And if you've been watching, you know, while I've been doing this, you've been seeing these action blocks and effects occasionally trip as our level kind of fluctuates between the top and the bottom of the uh, set points.